Between 1986 and 1991, a nationwide serial murder case took place in Weizong of South Korea. Over four and a half years, 10 women aged 13 to 71 were violated and brutally murdered. The South Korean police devoted 2.05 million police officers and 21,000 suspects and witnesses to catching this heartless killer. Finally, 33 years after the first murder, the killer was identified through DNA testing, and this is one of the top three contemporary murders in Korea. Today Detective Jojo will talk about a movie, Memories of Murder, based on this real case. This film is regarded as the best Korean crime film by many fans. The story took place in Korea on October 23, 1986. On this day, Detective Park finds a woman's dead body in a shady ditch. The body's naked and tied at the hands and feet. The woman has been violated and strangled, and her clothes are scattered in the nearby wheat field. Two months later, a young dead girl is found in a nearby village with her hands and feet tied. The modus operandi is similar to the first, the killer seems to be the same person. There's a suspicious footprint left at the crime scene. However, before Detective Park can take a look, the footprint is run over by the villager's junk car and becomes unrecognizable. Detective Park puts photos of all the males associated with the deceased in his book. While eating, he's staring at the suspect's photo. The police chief curiously asks him what he's doing. Detective Park explains that he has a special police intuition. As long as he keeps staring at the suspect, he would confirm at some point whether the other party was the murderer or not. However, this time Detective Park stares at a dozen suspects in a row but is unable to find the killer from them. When Detective Park's girlfriend is cleaning earwax for him, he learns an important clue from his girlfriend. She says there's a meat restaurant in the village. The owner's son named Kwang Ho is a little bit retarded. Kwang Ho used to follow the first victim around all the time. And the night the first victim was killed, an elderly had witnessed Kwang Ho following the victim. Detective Park immediately arrests Kwang Ho and tries to lead him to confess the truth about the murder. However, Kwang Ho denies that he's the murderer at all times. Detective Park's irascible partner named Tom kicks him to the ground and asks him to confess his crime. Detective Park hands him a shoe cover, and lets him put on the shoe cover before kicking so as not to leave any evidence. The poor man receives a fierce kick but insists that he has nothing to do with the murder. Detective Park then begins using his police intuition to stare at his eyes for a while and hastily identifies Kwang Ho as the murderer. To convict Kwang Ho as soon as possible to close the case, Detective Park steals a pair of Kwang Ho's sneakers and then runs to the scene of the second murder, leaving footprints, faking that Kwang Ho has been to the scene. On his way back to the police station, Detective Park notices a man following a woman on the roadside, the woman's face is full of panic, she seems to have met a pervert. Detective Park then kicks the man and beats him up, only to find that the man is Detective Joe sent by the city to assist in investigating the murder cases. It turns out that Joe just wants to ask for directions, but the woman mistakes him for a pervert. After taking Joe back to the police station, Detective Park forces Kwang Ho to confess to the crime with the photo of the footprints he has just forged. However, Kwang Ho still insists that he's not the murderer. In desperation, Detective Park takes him to a wilderness, threatening him to tell the truth or he would be buried alive. Faced with Detective Park's intimidation, the retarded Kwang Ho not only confesses to the crime but also describes how the first girl was killed in detail. And these details are exactly the same as what the police have discovered. Now Detective Park confirms that Kwang Ho is the murderer. Knowing the news, the police chief excitedly announces that the killer is caught and the serial case is solved. But after reading the case file, Joe confirms that Kwang Ho is not the killer because the rope tying the hands and feet of the two victims was tied with a complex and secure knot. But Kwang Ho's hands were burned in a childhood fire, leaving severe sequelae. He couldn't even hold chopsticks steady so he couldn't control the victims, not to mention the possibility of tying such complex knots. Joe tells the police chief his reasoning, but the police chief is eager to solve the case and ignores Joe. He intends to let Kwang Ho publicly identify the crime scene in front of the reporters. Soon, a group of people escorts Kwang Ho to the scene of the first murder. Kwang Ho sees his father in the crowd of villagers and suddenly shouts that he's wrongly accused, the scene is in chaos, and the identification work is interrupted. The media exposes that the police used illegal means to force a confession. The police chief then loses his post, and Kwang Ho is subsequently acquitted. After this incident, a new police chief comes to the police department. The new police chief relies more on the rational Joe than the reckless and impulsive Detective Park. Joe reports his two findings to the new police director. First, both crimes happened on a rainy night. Second, both victims wore red clothes when they were killed. Based on these two points, Joe compares the recent missing person's information and boldly speculates that there should be a third victim. Just a few days ago, another girl in a red dress disappeared on a rainy night. 
the new police director then asks Joe to search for that missing girl. Later, the girl's body is found in a reed field that's rarely visited by people, with the exact same modus operandi as the previous two cases. Joe meticulously examines the body and finds that the murderer is skillful and doesn't leave any clues. Just when the crowd is at a loss, the new chief comes up with a way to lure the killer out. Since the murderer likes to attack women in red, they let a female police officer wear a red dress to lure the murderer to show up. The next night it happens to be raining heavily. A policewoman purposely dresses in a red dress, strolling alone in the rain, Joe and several other police officers quietly hiding around to wait for the killer. However, the policewoman walks back and forth several times, but the killer doesn't appear. While they are hiding from the rain in the hut, two students also come in to take shelter. The students learn their police status and tell them the rumors they've heard at school. They've heard that the murderer is never caught because he has been hiding in the toilet behind the school and waiting until night to come out. And the students often hear women's screams and cries of pain from the hill behind the school. But the police don't take their words to heart. Meanwhile, a woman is going to deliver an umbrella to her husband working the night shift. Before she leaves home, she remembers the recent serial murder cases, so she takes off her red jacket. She's walking alone on the ridge next to a rice field and is panicked, looking around in the darkness. She sings a song to give herself courage but hears her singing mixed with a bizarre whistling sound. She freaks out so she starts to run. At that moment, a dark figure suddenly appears in the paddy field next to her, and lunges at her. The next day, the police find the woman's body near the paddy field with the same modus operandi and no clues. Just when Joe and the others are at wit's end, the attentive policewoman makes a significant discovery. In addition to the rainy night and the red dress, these several murders have another thing in common. Whenever there's a case, someone would request the radio station to play a song called Sad Letter. The music was broadcast on the same days as the murders. At that time, people have to send postcards to Korean radio stations to request a song. The person who ordered the song, Sad Letter, wrote on the postcard that he was a lonely man and wanted the radio station to play, Sad Letter, on a rainy day. Joe feels that this should not be a simple coincidence, the person who ordered the song is likely to be the murderer. He then goes to the radio station to find the postcard the suspect sent, but the radio station receives hundreds of letters from listeners every day. As there's no place to store these postcards, the postcards were sent to the dump and were burned, so Joe doesn't find any clues there. When all the police officers are depressed, Park's girlfriend tells him he could go to Shaman for help. Shaman is one that could tell fortunes well. Shaman sells Detective Park a talisman paper. It said that as long as the dirt of the crime scene is thrown on the talisman paper, it would reveal the killer's appearance. Detective Park and his partner Tom come to the scene of the fourth murder in the middle of the night to practice, but the talisman paper doesn't show anything. When Detective Park feels cheated by Shaman, a man suddenly appears at the scene. Detective Park thinks many criminals often had the habit of returning to the crime scene to relive the feelings of the crime. Therefore, Detective Park pulls Tom aside to secretly observe the man, looking for an opportunity to catch the suspect. But the two soon find that the visitor is actually Joe, who's here to re-examine the crime scene. However, another man slowly approaches the scene. Joe notices it and also immediately hides aside. This man's behavior is both lewd and suspicious, he first sneakily looks around. As he finds no one around, he pulls a set of ladies' underwear out of his pants and places them on the floor, after which he takes off his pants to reveal his red lace lady underwear. Then he amuses himself with the ladies' underwear on the floor. Detective Park quietly signals Tom to go forward and catch him, but Tom accidentally steps on a tree branch, making a sound, scaring away the man. Park, Tom and Joe immediately chase after him but lose him at a construction site. A large group of workers are there, all wearing the same clothes and masks, it's impossible to distinguish the man hiding among them. Detective Park accidentally catches a glimpse of a suspicious man. When he bends over to work, a section of his red lady underwear is revealed. It seems that this guy is the man just now. After all, the fetish of wearing ladies' underwear is not uncommon among men. Detective Park immediately rushes forward and uses his police instincts, gazing into his eyes. Soon he concludes that this man is the killer and arrests him back to the police station. In the face of interrogation, the man insists that he just has a special fetish but he has no guts to kill. To get him to confess the crime, Detective Park and Tom start to torture him. The new police chief is eager to solve the murder cases so he consents to let them punch the man. After being beaten for four days, the man can't take it anymore and admits he's the murderer. But when Park asks him to describe the details of the crimes, the man just says something irrelevant. Joe realizes that the man's not the real murderer. He's just beaten into submission. The man again mentions the toilet behind the school, reminding Joe of the rumors told to him by the students that night. 
To understand the story behind the toilet, Joe comes to the school and finds some important clues. Behind the school, on the hill, lives a somewhat deranged woman who's said to be the first victim of a serial killer and the only survivor. One night in September 1986, the woman was attacked by the killer. Although she managed to escape, the incident left a deep psychological shadow on her. She often dreams of the horror of her encounter. The screams and cries of the students mentioned earlier were actually the sounds made by the surviving woman. The surviving woman also provides an essential clue to Joe. Although she could not see the killer's face, she clearly remembered that the other party's hands were soft and smooth, as delicate as a woman's. After returning to the police station, Joe immediately checks the hands of the red underwear man. His hands have thick moss due to years of construction work, which obviously doesn't meet the characteristics of the killer. Joe suggests Detective Park let the man go. Detective Park sees Joe again deny his judgment and becomes so angry that he begins to fight with Joe. While fighting, the song, Sad Letter, is playing on the radio again, and it's raining outside. Detective Park and Joe have a feeling that the killer's going to do it again. The new police chief immediately contacts the military, hoping the other side would send more people to search for the killer. But because of political turmoil in Korea, the local army and the police were all deployed to maintain stability, and there's no support for the murder case. Due to the lack of police workforce, the killer once again succeeds. The next day the police find a fifth woman's body by a pool. The killer's even more brutal this time, stuffing nine pieces of chopped peaches into the deceased's body as if he was deliberately taunting and provoking the police. The autopsy result shows that the time of death was between 7.30 and 8 o'clock last night. At that time, Detective Park and Joe were busy fighting, and the red underwear man was locked up in the police station so he's obviously not the killer. The police have to let him go. After this incident, Detective Park becomes very depressed, admits that his previous investigation is a waste of time, and has deep doubts about his police instincts. The police station receives a call that the radio station staff finds the postcard with the song, Sad Letter, from last night. Based on the address on the postcard, Detective Park and Joe arrest the suspect Hyungyu, who's good-looking and has soft, smooth hands precisely as described by the survivors. And this man is a retired soldier, especially good at fighting and not tying. Even more suspicious is that Hyungyu just moved to the nearby village in September 1986. The first case happened right around this time. All the evidence points to this man as the murderer. When the police interrogate Hyungyu, he denies involvement in the murders, just like the other suspects. Joe plays the song, Sad Letter, to stimulate Hyungyu, while describing the killer's pathological psychology and the process of the crime. Hyungyu is on the verge of a breakdown and seems about to confess. But Tom, who's in a violent mood, suddenly kicks Hyungyu to the ground. Tom's intention is to have Hyungyu tell the truth as soon as possible. However, the sudden kick disrupts Joe's interrogation, makes Hyungyu regain his composure, and refuses to answer any questions. The new chief is angry with Tom's recklessness and reprimands him severely. Tom feels ashamed and comes to Kwang Ho's family's meat restaurant to drink alone. Joe has also lost his patience and reason. He even suggests Detective Park continue to use violent means to force a confession, but now Detective Park has become cautious. He's worried that using severe torture to force a confession would result in a wrong conviction like Kwang Ho and the red underwear man before. Speaking of Kwang Ho, an idea flashes in Joe's mind. Kwang Ho has accurately described the process of the first victim's murder, so if Kwang Ho is not the murderer, he is probably a witness. Detective Park and Joe immediately rush to the meat restaurant to look for Kwang Ho, but he's not there. Detective Park finds Tom drinking and sits next to him to comfort him. The TV is broadcasting the news of the serial murders, and the customers at the next table start to curse the police as losers after watching it. These words anger Tom, and he grabs a bottle and wrestles with the guests at the next table. Just then, Kwang Ho comes back. When he sees that the police officer who has beaten him is causing trouble in his store, Kwang Ho grabs a wooden stick and strikes Tom, the nail at the top of the stick pierces Tom's right leg. When Kwang Ho sees the blood on the stick, he runs away in fear. Detective Park and Joe hurriedly chase after him and finally stop Kwang Ho in a rice paddy. Kwang Ho is unable to accurately describe the killer's appearance, but describes him as handsome, much more handsome than himself, which also fits Hyungyu's appearance. Just as Detective Park takes out Hyungyu's photo for Kwang Ho to identify, Kwang Ho's father arrives here with the two beaten guests. It turns out that they think the police are going to arrest Kwang Ho, and because of their distrust of the police, several people go straight up and fight with Detective Park and Joe. Amidst the chaos, Kwang Ho runs to the side of the railway track and is hit and killed by a speeding train. The only witness is dead and the police, who have no evidence, have to acquit Hyungyu. Just when everyone is feeling desperate, Good news comes from the forensics department, they find the killer's body fluid on the fifth victim's clothes. 
Now, a DNA test is all that's needed to confirm whether Hyungyu is the killer or not. But the problem is that DNA testing technology is unavailable in Korea then, and the sample has to be sent to the United States. Before the test result comes out, the only thing the police can do is wait. But then, Detective Park receives the bad news that Tom, injured by the nail, contracts tetanus and has to have his leg amputated to save his life. Looking at his partner's lost right leg, Detective Park is overwhelmed by a deep sense of powerlessness. Joe is worried that Hyungyu would commit another crime and starts to monitor him 24 hours a day. One night, Hyungyu is drinking alone at a restaurant, and Joe is too tired so he takes a nap. As he wakes up, Hyungyu is gone. Joe immediately returns to the police station and anxiously requests the police chief to deploy staffing to search for Hyungyu throughout. However, the chief thinks that Hyungyu would not dare to do anything while he is under investigation. The next day, the police find the sixth body. In the heavy rain, Joe recognizes the victim as a high school girl he has met earlier. This time it only begins to rain after the police find the body. In other words, the murderer did not wait for the rainy night to commit a new murder. Looking at the girl's tender face, Joe's grief and anger peak. He rushes to Hyungyu's home, drags him to the nearby railroad tracks and beats him severely, then pulls out his gun and forces him to confess if he's the murderer or not. Hyungyu asks Joe what he wants to hear but then grabs a rock and swings the gun out of his hand. At that moment, Detective Park arrives at the scene with the DNA test results sent from the United States, and Joe eagerly opens the file bag. However, to everyone's surprise, the result shows that the DNA sample from the murder scene does not match Hyungyu's DNA. In other words, Hyungyu is not the murderer, at least not of the fifth murder. This result completely shatters all of Joe's sanity. He states that the document is a lie and that he doesn't need it to know that Hyungyu is the killer. He angrily raised his gun, wanting to finish off the pervert in front of him. But Detective Park stops him, chokes Hyungyu and forces him to look into his eyes. Detective Park intends to use his police intuition for the last time to confirm whether Hyungyu is the murderer or not. But after a long stare, Detective Park is unable to get any conclusion. They can only reluctantly let Hyungyu go. After more than a decade, Detective Park has long resigned from the police and is now a salesman. One day when he is about to deliver goods to customers, he happens to pass by the ditch where the body was found, he squats down and looks deep into the ditch as before, the ditch is empty, as if the crime had never happened. At that moment, a little girl passing by curiously asks Detective Park what he is looking at. The girl tells Detective Park, that just a short time ago, a man was staring at the ditch like Detective Park. The girl asked the same question at the time, and the man replied that he remembered what he had done here before. So he came back to take a look. Hearing this, Detective Park is stunned as he thinks only the murderer who committed the murder will return to the scene. He hurriedly asks the girl what the man looks like. The girl replies that the man looks kind of plain. Detective Park asks again, the girl thinks for a long time and still replies the man looks very ordinary, that's it. Hearing her answer, Detective Park turns his head and looks at the camera blankly and reluctantly. The film comes to its end in his long gaze. So who's the real killer? This story is based on a real serial murder case called Weizong Case. When Memories of Murder was released in 2003, more than a decade had passed since the Weizong case, but at that time the killer had not yet been brought to justice. It wasn't until 2019 that the real killer Lee chun -jae of the Weizong case was arrested. In 2003, if Lee chun -jae had happened to watch this film based on the evil he had committed, he would have looked through the screen and confronted Detective Park in the last shot. So who's the real killer? Until the end, we don't get to know who the real killer is. Detective Jojo thinks there is more than one murderer because Kwang Ho described the murderer as a handsome man. Still, the little girl at the end said that the man looked ordinary. I think this story is trying to say that who killed the victims was not the murderer but the era Korea was living in. In the end, Detective Park was staring at not only the murderer and the audience but the whole Korean society of that era. The film's focus is to reflect the incompetence of the Korean government at that time, the officials' rottenness, and the people's helplessness through the incidents. The film doesn't only refer to the memory of this murder case, but also to the memory of that era. Comment below who you think is the killer. If you enjoy the video please subscribe and Detective Jojo will bring up more stories next time.